Yeah. Welcome. So here we are. We're streaming live from um, from Featherstone Court in Rockville, and uh, and so I just put out that uh, so I can see Paul's there. G'day, Paul and Janet. G'day, John Baldwin down in Sydney. Good to see you guys. G'day, Akeem, Charles Akimu. Welcome, Apostle Charles, Rick, Debbie, Gay. Uh, wonderful to uh, be able to see you guys on here. Hello, Neil and Elaine. Wonderful to see you. Hey, this is so cool being able to do this. Innocent Satima from Malawi, so this is international. Lorraine from down in uh, Rochester. She's just come on. Uh, just wonderful. Wonderful to see everybody here. So the purpose of, uh, of this is just to, I, I want to try to keep it to half an hour. We'll see if we can do that. But it's just to bring a, a little bit of a study on the word pestilence in the Bible, seeing as though that's the thing that's going on at the moment, um, that there's this virus uh, going around the world that, uh, um, anyway, it seems like it's really bad, but and in some places it's been worse than others. And, um, and for a little while it seemed, do we take this thing seriously or not? And uh, is it just like the flu or not? But anyway, no matter what you think about it, the fact is is that so many of the world's systems are shutting down, economies are uh, being broken, um, yeah, people are being put out of work, uh, and a number of other things that we're going to look at here. But I want to open up in Psalm 91. So this is so we, we're going to look basically, I think, around seven points of the pestilence. There's many more that you could look at. So this is just to whet your appetite and get you to study this at the moment because. To find out what God is saying is not just to hear what the Spirit is saying in some ethereal way or some uh, mystical way, but it's to search the Scriptures and find out from the Scriptures uh, what, what do some of these things mean? What was happening around uh, these pestilences that we read about in the Bible? What was God saying? What was God requiring of His people when these things came? And how do we eventually get out of it? How does it stop? So we're going to start, number one, in, in Psalm 91, and I know that a number of you who are watching would probably have uh, been quoting this psalm. I know that our brother Joshua Otieno in Kenya, um, he had this psalm come to him as the, as the word of God for 2020. And so when this has all happened, he said, well, wow, now it's really confirmed this is the word for 2020. But we're going to read in Psalm 91, we're going to begin in verse 1. So this is the first point about the pestilence. And it says in verse 1, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of Yahweh, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Hello Anne and George and Tui. God bless you guys. Good to see you coming up there. So we're looking in Psalm 91. And, uh, and so here it's saying that if we will abide under the shadow of the Almighty and dwell in the secret place of the Most High, that then He will deliver us from the snare of the fowler and He will even deliver us from the perilous pestilence. So here's a wonderful promise to begin with, is that if we abide in Christ, if we abide under the shadow of the Almighty, if we, are, if we make Him our refuge and, and if we come into that secret place and and there's a verse that's been going around. I've seen it on Facebook and we were talking about it this morning. But in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 20, it, it says that look, basically go into your chamber and hide yourself for a time until the indignation is passed. And so if there's anything that we can take out of what is going on at the moment in the world, it's that there's a forced, uh, in many places, we're being forced to actually go into that chamber and come into the secret place with God. So if you don't, if there's no other, if there's no other uh, message that you get out of, of this, uh, then, then the one thing that we can all take away is, is that God wants us to get into the chamber. He wants us to get into the secret place. He wants us to find the secret place of His presence and be hidden in His pavilion and just could draw closer to God. So for many of us who have a very busy life, we're doing this, doing that, doing this, uh, this time for many of us in the countries that have had major lockdowns and, and uh, restrictions placed on them, this is a time to draw near to God. This is a time to come close to Him in intimacy and relationship in the secret place. So use the time that we're given here to come into that secret place. 
So, uh, yes, I'll do that. So Paul's just shared that I encourage all of you who are watching to share um, this live stream on your Facebook page. So please do that. Uh, if you haven't done it already, just share it on your page. That way the reach gets even more. It's great to see 20 people are watching at the moment. But uh, as you share it, even more people will be able to see this. Hallelujah. And yeah, please feel free to, um, and Arafash, you can send greetings to Dad, Paul, and Mum, Janet. That's great. So please feel free to make some comments. It's great because that way I can know that you're watching and you're interacting. It's wonderful. So continuing in Psalm 91 then. So we know that God, if we abide in the shadow of the Almighty, then we will be delivered from the perilous pestilence. And so there's a sure word for us. Um, we were talking this morning as well. There was a brother in the... Um, uh, that was, he, he became very famous during the Second World War. But during the time of the Spanish flu, there was a brother named Reese Howes, and uh, he was in South Africa at the time, and there were many people passing away, dying from the Spanish flu. But on the compound that he had with his wife when he was over in South Africa, they, uh, they had a faith, they had a conviction in their heart that on their compound not, they would not lose one person. They would not lose a person to this Spanish flu. And, and that became true. And even some unbelieving tribes came to them because they knew that something's going on here. Hello, Michael and Margaret. Hello, Raya. God bless you guys. Good to see you. So when they, when they, they came to that compound to say, we know that uh, people aren't dying here. We want, we want your help. And Reese House told them, yes, you can have our help and you can come on here. Can somebody who knows Hillary please ring her and just give her a little bit of help in getting onto Facebook? She's just trying to call me in the middle of this. So if somebody knows Hillary, could just give Hillary a quick call and help her get onto Facebook? She's really trying to get on. Um, so, yes, so that he said to this, uh, this tribe, hello, Darlene and Jeff, he said to this tribe, you only if you acknowledge that it's the true God who's doing it and you'll not give glory to your false gods, the gods that you worship. And so then they finally humbled down and they agreed to do that. And they did not lose one soul on, uh, on that compound. And so we can also trust in God in the same way, in His Word, that if we abide in the secret place of the Most High, we'll be delivered from the perilous pestilence. Now, we're just reading on in Psalm 91, in verse 4, it says that He will cover us with His feathers, and under His wings we will take refuge. His truth shall be our shield and buckler. And brethren, this is the key thing in these days. While there may be a good drug coming out, uh, the, you know, people have been talking about the, the thing that seems to have been working against this disease. You know what the real shield against this is? You know what the real buckler against this disease is and this pestilence has taken over the, over the world at the moment? It's the truth, the truth of the Word of God. That is our shield, that is our buckler. Because, you know, the, even bigger than the virus itself is the fear that it has been causing. And how do we get delivered from fear? It's through the truth of the Word of God. If we know the truth, the truth will make us free and we will be delivered. So when, many people spend a lot of time listening to the media, listening to what's going on in the world. Now, you can do that from time to time, but don't make that what you feed on. If you feed on that, you'll get fear. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Fear comes by hearing and hearing by the news and the media. So stay away. Don't spend so much time watching that. Make sure you're spending time in the secret place listening to the Word of God, the truth. That is our shield, that is our buckler. And we will find ourselves under the covering of His feathers. Now, what are His feathers? Well, that's the place of the, of the Holy of Holies. That's the place where the, the wings of the cherubim cover. Amen. That's under His feathers. Hallelujah. And that's where God is calling us into, into this place, under the shadow of His wings, under His feathers. Hallelujah. And so then it says in verse 5 that if we do this, if we will make truth our buckler and shield, if we'll dwell under the covering of His feathers, and that's our covering. He says, You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the, verse 6, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. So this pestilence walks in darkness. You can't see it. It, it just it, it comes up, but you don't see it. But guess what? We will not be afraid of it. Fear is to be removed. And Father, in the name of Jesus, through the truth of your word, today let's break fear. 
off of God's people. There are people who are even people of God, but they're afraid. They've been scared. And we need to help them know the truth of the Word of God so that they no longer fear this thing, but are able to walk in faith, hearing the Word of God as our shield. And the final promise there that just to mention today out of Psalm 91 is that a thousand men may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. What a wonderful promise. Hallelujah. What a wonderful promise. Amen. So number one point then about the pestilence is, is that we'll be delivered from it and it will not cause us harm or fear if we abide under the shadow and under the covering of the Almighty. Amen. All right, so the second thing then that I want to share about the pestilence, I want to go to the first mention of this word pestilence. So this word pestilence is a Hebrew word, deber. And if you have a strong concordance, you can look it up. It's number 1698. And, um, and it, means, uh, it means a pestilence. It means uh, a sickness that is causing destruction and death. And so this is what this Hebrew word means. Um, You can look up a bit of the root meaning, which is quite interesting, but we won't go there. But if the first mention is in Exodus chapter 5, let's go to Exodus chapter 5 and verse, uh, we'll read verse 2 and 3. And this is in the context uh, of Moses coming to Pharaoh and, uh, and beginning the whole phase of calling for God's people to be delivered. And so in in Exodus chapter 5, Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh and they say that thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, verse 1, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I don't know Yahweh, nor will I let Israel go. So here we have a a major leader of of the world at that time. And and here we see that, uh, that... He's saying, who is Yahweh, you know, that I should let God's people go to hold a feast. And so this is representing even governments and places that have been holding God's people from from worshipping God. And so then in verse 3, it says, so they said, this is what Moses and Aaron told Pharaoh. It says, they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days journey into the desert and sacrifice to Yahweh our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. So here, uh, Moses and Aaron were saying, look, if you don't let us worship God, he will fall on us with a pestilence. This is very interesting, isn't it? You know, it's like it's a little bit of a threat, if you like, or, a, or a, this is going to be the consequence, Pharaoh, that if you don't let us go and worship God, then God's going to fall on us, even the people of God, but God's going to fall on us, everyone, if you don't let us go and worship God. Hallelujah. So just as an interesting thing that this happened in China, uh, a country that has been trying to block, this this came from China, a country that's been trying to block the believers in Jesus worshipping the true God, the the Lord Jesus Christ. They've been trying to block people from worshipping Him. And God's fallen with a pestilence. Interesting. But we can even see it too, that unless unless we learn to worship God in the way that He has prescribed, then that opens the door for pestilence or sword, or the sword could be like war, to come. And so what's the antidote? And, and what can we give ourselves to even in this particular time that this is going on? Because many of us, like I said, have been under restrictions where many of us are in our homes, etc. But what can we do? Well, we can learn to worship God in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24, Jesus said, God is spirit. And we don't need to worry about whether we worship on this mountain or that mountain. And you know what God's done? He's got the church out of the buildings. Isn't it amazing? So no longer do you have to go down the road to the church building to worship. No longer do you have to go to a dedicated building for worship. But you, we, God is teaching us that in our own homes, in anywhere we are, we can worship God in spirit and truth. We don't need to go to this mountain or that mountain. We don't need to go to the big place or the small place, whatever it is. We can worship God. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So what's one of the messages that, 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 that we learn from the Exodus chapter 5? Is that if God is not worshipped, in spirit and truth. If God is not worshipped in the way that He has prescribed, then He may fall or God may allow 
pestilence or the sword to come. And so maybe, and I'm not saying these are all, I'm not saying these are definites, I'm just unveiling the word of God so that we can take a message out of it. So I'm not coming as a prophet to say this is what God is doing as such. But what can we learn? That pestilence and sword can come as a result of there not being the proper worship uh, being allowed or done even by his church. And so let's worship God. Let's worship him in spirit and truth. Do it in your households. Do it in your homes. Do it wherever you are. Learning now that God is wanting to teach his church that we are the church. It's not a building. And that we can worship God in spirit and in truth. That means we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and we need to know the truth of the word so that we can understand who God really is and worship him according to who he really is. And that's worship that is acceptable to God. So the second thing about the pestilence is, is that pestilence comes when there is not proper worship, worshiping God in spirit and truth. We are the circumcision in Christ, rejoicing in Christ Jesus, worshiping God in the spirit and having no confidence in the flesh. Amen. All right, so let's go to number three now. I want you to go to Leviticus. So the first one was that if we abide under the shadow of the Almighty, we'll be delivered from the pestilence and we'll be delivered even from the fear of it as well. And then the second thing was is that proper worship is uh, when, when, when worshiping God in spirit and truth is not done, then pestilence can come. Now Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26. So the third point about pestilence. Now, the key verse is, uh, is verse 25, but I just want to give a bit of background coming up to verse, 20, uh, verse 25. So it's Leviticus chapter 26, the key verse, verse 25. But really beginning from verse 14, God begins a series of, uh, of pronouncing cursings or judgments as a result of disobedience. So in verse 14 and 15, this is, this is like the premise for the rest of the chapter. He says, God says, but if you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes, this is verse 14 and 15 of Leviticus 26, that if you despise my statutes or if your soul abhors or detests my judgments so that you do not perform all my commandments but break my covenant, I also will do this to you. So now God is saying that if you're not going to obey me, if you're not going to listen to me, if you're not going to walk according to my ways, and many of us can think, oh, that's just Old Covenant, that's Old Testament. Well, I just want to encourage you that don't read the Bible that way. See, we walk by faith, and so we, we can hear God. And if we hear God and we're disobedient, then, then of course we're not going to be under that covering. We're not going to be under that protection. And so, yes, these curses can still come on, on, on the people of God uh, when they're not being obedient. But look, these curses are not uh, necessarily eternal curses. These are things that come to wake God's people up. They come even, you could almost say that these judgments come as a mercy from God so that we begin to wake up and go, hey, we need to come back to God. We need to learn to listen and obey His commands listening to his voice and I just want to encourage you that uh, that we are to obey God we as new covenant believers are to obey God in the spirit we're to obey God by hearing him and the hearing of faith and so there's a difference between just what the Bible says and then the hearing of faith see we need to hear the voice of the Lord in these days and that's why coming into his secret place presence is a wonderful thing that we've been given the opportunity to do so that we can hear the voice and obey and so then God says that he will appoint terror in verse 16, even wasting disease and fever. So there's already a, a comment on disease and fever coming right at the beginning. And he says there will be consuming of the eyes, sorrow of heart, uh, sowing our seed in vain, and, and God will set his face against us. Now, verse 18 and 19 is very important here. He says, and after all this, so in other words, there's a first round of judgment. And he says, and after all this, if you do not obey me, now, this is scary. He says that I will punish you seven times more for your sins. And then verse 19 gives us the reason why he does it. He says, I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze. So what does God want to do even through bringing judgments? He wants to break the pride of our power. He wants to break the pride in us that thinks that we can do it. We can, we can do everything ourselves. 
We can just trust in ourselves. We can do church our own way. We, we can worship God our own way. We can teach our own things. We, we're just going to stay in line with a certain denominational doctrine and theology because that's we're just going to keep according to man's tradition. We're going to do it that way. God sends these things even to break the pride of our power and cause us to humble down and seek God's face together. Amen. So then coming up then to verse 23, let's just read it from there. He says, and if by these things, there's a second round of judgment. He says, and if by these things you are not reformed by me, and brethren, we are in a period of reformation, hallelujah. He says, but if by these things you are not reformed by me, but you still walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you, and I will punish you yet seven times more for your sins. And then he says in verse 25, And I will bring a sword against you that will execute the vengeance of the covenant. When you are gathered together within your cities, I will send pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. And so now we see the pestilence comes on the third round of judgments here. Again, to bring us reformation. And I, I think that word is really amazing there in that he says, and if by the thing, these things you are not reformed. And God is still bringing a reformation to us. And so even through this pestilence, again, I'm not saying that this is de- this is the, the reason why this is happening. But here we can see that God does send pestilence so that he will bring reformation within his people, that we will reform, that we will again come back to his ways and doing things his way. So no matter what we're thinking uh, about, maybe we think that what we've been doing is right, maybe we think that we've been on the right track, and maybe we have, maybe we haven't, but this is a time to seek God and say, God, what are you still wanting to reform in us? What are you still wanting to change in us? Because we have a perfect opportunity to do that. Okay, so that was number three. Let's go to number four about the pestilence. Now we're going to go to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. So this is the fourth point now about the pestilence. Numbers chapter 14. And we're going to begin in verse 11. Now you'll know that this was the time when uh, Moses had had sent out the spies in, in chapter 13 to spy out the land. They came back. And they, they actually gave a bad report. Ten of them did. And remember J, uh, Joshua and Caleb, they gave a good report. But now in chapter 14, hey, Arthur's there. Arthur, good to see you, man. Hallelujah. So in Numbers chapter 14, verse 11, we see that uh, in response to this bad report, and, and, and may I say that in the context of, of what's happening in Numbers here, it was a whole generation that had come out of Egypt. They'd been saved. Let's say in type, they'd been born again. As a shadow, they'd been born again. They'd come through the waters of baptism through the Red Sea. Then they'd come to Mount Sinai. They'd receive the law, a type of Pentecost, a type of receive. Say in the New Testament, the 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 fulfilment of, of Mount Sinai, the law coming on tablets of stones, was receiving the law into our hearts by receiving the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we've got a type there, a picture of Pentecost happening. And now they're meant to be coming into the land, the inheritance. And yet a whole generation rejected the inheritance, except for two people. A whole generation rejected the inheritance that was offered them. And God was upset. And in Numbers chapter 14, verse 11, so I'm just wanting to make this seem relevant to us is that there's been a generation that has received Pentecost. And, and, it, and there was a powerful move that happened in the last decades. A charismatic revival and, and even for the last century, a Pentecostal type of revival. But the, there's only been a few that have been actually looking for the inheritance, the next feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. And so in that generation, there was two men who came out of that saying, no, we can do it. We can go into the inheritance because God will give us the inheritance. Let's not remain here. Let's not get scared. Let's not go. Let's not stay here. And yet that whole generation rejected it. Hello, Julie. Welcome. Good to see you. So then in verse 11, God says, Yahweh says to Moses, How long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? Then this is what God says he was going to do. He says, I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them. And I will make of you, Moses, a nation greater and mightier than they. Now, the good news, I guess, here is that God didn't end up doing that. 
he didn't end he didn't end up disinheriting that nation he didn't end up making a nation out of Moses and so this is the encouragement for us is that see God wants all of his people to come into the inheritance he wants all of his people and to come into the land but there has been many who've been blocked by religion, blocked by unbelief. And by doing that, they've been rejecting the will of God for themselves. They've been rejecting what God has been offering them. And so God is raising up some people in this time. And he's been raising us up as an apostolic company to be heralding this news that there's a place to go. It's like there's a Joshua and Caleb company saying, no, we can do it. God is going to bring us into this land if we will just believe him. If we will just listen to his word and come into the deeper things of God, then we will believe him. And so, but Moses was able to intercede on behalf of the nation. And this is the encouragement that for those of you who have ears to hear, is that maybe us too, if, if God in any way is bringing this pestilence in order to, because he's, he's been fed up with some people, uh, in the, even in the church, uh, a generation that has been rejecting where God wants to take us and, and, and the deeper things of God, the, the word of God to bring us onto maturity. If there has been and God is annoyed with that, there can be a generation of us who can intercede like Moses and say, God, bring your people into the land. Pardon the iniquity of your people. You're slow to anger. You're long-suffering. That's basically the prayer that Moses begins to pray through the rest of the chapter. And then God says, in, um, I just want you to see this in verse 20 and 21. God's answer to that intercession, after he said he would bring pestilence due to their rejection and unbelief, Moses interceded and God says, Yahweh said, I have pardoned according to your word. But truly as I live, the whole earth shall be filled with the glory of Yahweh. Hallelujah. Amen. And so God is willing to pardon the iniquity of God's people. And if we will intercede, God may pardon. But he, he reiterates, so this is the plan. And even through all this, what's happening, this is still the plan. It never changes. As truly as I live, the whole earth will be filled with my glory, with the glory of Yahweh. Hallelujah. Some people may miss out because of rejection and unbelief, but let's be a people who don't miss out and who intercede so that maybe some others can come into it that hadn't seen it before. Amen. Hallelujah. So that's number four. Number five. Now this is a... Number five is in... I want to go to Second Chronicles <clears throat> chapter 7. You know, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 is a verse that many people quote um, uh, about revival and, and they quote it fine. It's, it's all right to do that. But very often we don't read the couple of verses beforehand and it gives it even more of a context for us today. So in Second Chronicles chapter 7, we're going to read verse 12 to 14. This is point number five about the pestilence. It says, Then Yahweh appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. And have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. And so this is in the context that Solomon has just dedicated the house of God. He's, and, and God has come and he's filled that place with his glory. And, and Solomon had prayed and even one of the mentions in that prayer was uh, that God, when, when you send the pestilence or when you, shut, when you shut heaven and when you send the pestilence, he says, and, and, then, you're, and then the people turn towards this house and they pray towards you hear from heaven amen and act and forgive you forgive the sin of your people hallelujah yes and so and and, and so the, he, Moses, uh, Solomon dedicated this place as a place where we could run to at the house of God is a place a sanctuary the sanctuary of God is a place we can turn to we can turn to God and he will hear from heaven and so then it says in verse 13 of second Chronicles 7 God says, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain, and, and that's relevant for us here in, in, in Australia as well, even though we have had rain, there's still serious drought in many places. Or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence. Here's the mention of pestilence. Or send pestilence among my people. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. So the right thing to do no matter what's going on no matter why we think this may be coming on the nations at the moment, no matter why we think pestilence is coming, the best thing we can all do is humble ourselves. We just say, God, we humble ourselves under your mighty hand. God, we, we, we lower ourselves before you. 
we, we, this thing is too big for us. You know, I've seen that many are sort of standing up against it and rebuking it and da-da-da. That's okay if you know you have the authority, if you know you have the conviction to actually do that. But before we even get into that place of being able to rebuke and send this thing away, the first place is humble yourself. Even James 4, 7 says, submit to God, resist the devil, then he will flee. The first thing we must do is get ourselves in the right position before God. We must be standing right before God. Whoever humbles himself, God will give grace. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So please don't be trying to rebuke uh, this sickness, this disease that's going on out of pride. And, uh, and you'll know the difference because faith is a real conviction that comes from down here. It's something that God puts in us. And when we have the faith to do that, we do it. But if we don't have the faith, what's the answer? We humble ourselves and we can receive grace. And then the faith will come because God gives his word. And then we can hear that word and live by that word. And then release that word into the nations. Amen. So if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And so this is what we can do. Seek my face. Or you could translate it, seek my presence. And turn from their wicked ways. And so it's a good time for us to go, God, is there any wicked way in me? Is there still anything that is not pleasing to you? And allow him to show us individually, corporately, what are you wanting to change? Then God says, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. The healing will come. But what do we need to do? Humble ourselves. Number one. What else do we need to do? Pray. Talk to God. Talk to God about everything that's going on in our heart and even ask God to help us know by the Spirit what we should be praying in these days. Number three. Seek His face. Look for His presence. Number four. Turn from our wicked ways. Amen. So that when we, are, when we are praying and seeking His face, then things come to light where we know we've been missing the mark, where we've been sinning. Maybe not willfully or intentionally, but where we've been missing it. And then we can turn from our wicked ways. God then promises, one, I will hear. Two, I will forgive. Three, I will heal the land. Hallelujah. What a, number, what a wonderful promise again in regards to this pestilence. Okay. Number six, amen. And I'll give a bit of a summary towards the end there. So number six is, and this is two more points. We're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 24. 2 Samuel chapter 24. And we won't, we definitely won't have time to go through all this. You can read it in your own time. But the context is, is that, uh, is that David, oh, sorry about that, Mamaraya, is that David has uh, just, he, he just told Joab to go and uh, take a census of all God's people and uh, all around the, the nation of Israel. Joab even tried to warn David, don't do this. Amen. And, and it was sin. It was wrong for him to do that. Now, why, why would it be a sin? Uh, number one, because God didn't want it. It's, it's a command not for him not to do that. But why? You know, many... Many Christians all over the world today, uh, they, they have a pride in how many people go to their church. Pastors have a pride in how many people are attending their church. They take stock of, of the, the attendance, the amount of people, all this sort of stuff. There has been a, a, a bit of a craze about, um, about mega churches and huge meetings. And, and um, there's something that we feel like God must be doing something if there's lots of people. And, and so God, I believe, He wants us to know that it's not by might nor by power, but by His Spirit, says Yahweh. It's not by how many people. God does not save by... God can save by many or by few. In the days of Gideon, in fact, He didn't want a lot of people. Why? Because then the people would get the glory. But now, when there's, when there's a fewer amount, like in the days of Gideon, God gets all the glory. And so God would rather a few obedient ones than a mass of people who, who have a faith but are disobedient. And so God doesn't want us to have our trust or our comfort in the amount of people or even seeing a big crowd. That's not what He's wanting. And He doesn't want us to try to measure even the people of God by, by in that sort of standard. Amen. Our measuring stick is that we are bringing people to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It's, it's not got to do with the numbers. Hallelujah. And so David did that. It was sin. 
And so in 2 Samuel chapter 24, um, finally David realizes it in verse 10, and he says that his heart condemned him when he'd, after he'd numbered the people. And David said, I've sinned greatly in what I've done. But now I pray, O Yahweh, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I've done very foolishly. And so here we see that, uh, we see, we're going to see that a judgment came because of David as the leader and what he did. And so now judgment was going to come on the people because of what David as the leader did. David was repentant. But then when David arose in verse 11, the word of God came to Gad, David's seer, a prophet, and said in verse 12, Thus says Yahweh, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself that I may do it to you. And so Gad came to David in verse 13 and told him, Shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Or shall you flee three months before your enemies while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days plague in your land? And this word plague has got, has got to do with the pestilence here. Now consider and see what answer I should take back to him who sent me. And it says, David said, I am in great distress. Please let us fall into the hand of Yahweh for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. And so Yahweh sent a plague. He sent a pestilence. So it's interesting that Yahweh actually sent a plague in response to David saying, let us fall into the hands of Yahweh and not man, because his mercies are great. So what this says to me, and we'll see that this is what happened, is that God can stop the pestilence any time. And David knew if we fall into the hands of Yahweh in terms of a pestilence, then I know God's heart of mercy, that, that it's much better than falling into the hands of man. It's just interesting. And so then it says the angel stretched out in verse 16 his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it. And Yahweh relented from the destruction and said to the angel who was destroying the people, it's enough. Now restrain your hand. And the angel of Yahweh was by the threshing floor of Arau, Arauna, the Jebusite. And then David spoke to Yahweh when he saw the angel who was striking the people. And he said, Surely I have sinned, and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. And so the story continues. So the angel uh, took his hand back at the, at the instruction of Yahweh as David cried out to God in repentance as the leader. And so again, I'm not saying that this is definitely the reason, but we can see some relevance that where there's been leaders of God's people and any of us who are a leader that's watching this, we need to be so careful that we don't get into a place of pride and, uh, and, and start thinking this and that. Oh, look at how many people I've got. or look at this on, on any human level, thinking that, that's, that somehow we're making it because of this and that. But God wants us to be totally in tune with Him, trusting Him, and not putting our trust in human measurements. Okay. And so, but he came into the hands of Yahweh and Yahweh showed mercy. He couldn't keep judging. The other interesting thing is, is that the place where this pestilence got dealt with was on the threshing floor of Arauna or Ornan, the Jebusite, it says in 1 Chronicles. And who knows anything about the history of the people of God, that that threshing floor ended up becoming the land on which the temple, the house of God, was built. Hallelujah. So in the place where the pestilence was released by the angel, and then at the place where the pestilence was stopped by the angel of Yahweh, that place became the land on which the house of God could be built. Hallelujah. So prophetically, we could see that that as this pestilence has come into the nations, maybe God is preparing the land on which the house of God can now be built all through the nations. Hallelujah. That maybe He's preparing the land so that there's a place ready now for that dwelling place of God in the Spirit to fully come to pass. Because as we know, David didn't end up building it, but he got the land and then his son Solomon built the house in his generation on that land where the pestilence was stopped. Hallelujah. So maybe God is preparing some land, talking about the hearts of men and women, talking about our lives, that He's preparing many in the nations now to be able to be built up to be that dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Final point about the pestilence. Amen. I hope you are getting a lot out of this. And I hope you're encouraged to
interest even to study some things through. So in Habakkuk, final one now, point number seven, we're going to go to Habakkuk. Habakkuk. And I'll just start it in chapter two, the end of chapter two. Habakkuk chapter two. Now, if you're if you're getting something out of this and enjoying it, please feel free to give you know a yeah, thumbs up. I like seeing those likes coming up, and it helps it helps me know you're listening. If you want to share a comment, please feel free to put a comment on there as well. Uh, amen. So, point number seven. Now we're in Habakkuk chapter two. We all, many of us here, would know verse fourteen. Verse 14 says, again, God declaring his purpose in the midst of all these judgments that he's declaring in Habakkuk chapter 2. He declares, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge, excuse me, with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. So God, again, just like in Numbers chapter 14, in the midst of judgment, but then when the judgment was stopped by that intercession of Moses, God made again that clear statement that the earth will be filled with the glory of Yahweh. Now again, in the midst of sharing judgments with Habakkuk, he's saying that again, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. Hallelujah. And then in verse 18 and 19, God takes aim at the idols of the nations and at the idols that, that God's people had. And he says that they're, they're molded images, carved images, teachers of lies. So these idols are teachers of lies. Amen. So they're not only statues. They're not only physical objects. These idols are teachers of lies, doctrines of demons, traditions of men that people have held in high regard and they've worshipped that in place of Yahweh, in place of Jesus. And so he says, Woe to him who says to wood, awake, in verse 19 of Habakkuk 2. To silent stone, arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, yet in it there is no breath at all. Verse 20, though, says, But, the, but Yahweh is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. Very interesting. What's happened all around the world, especially in Western nations, but just about in many, many nations all around the world, you know what's stopped? People are not allowed to go to their worship buildings, whether that be Christian worship buildings, Muslim worship buildings, Buddhist worship buildings. These places are closed. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. Hallelujah. You know what else is closed? Pubs, nightclubs. All these restaurants, you know, like in our society, you know, food and drink and, and partying has become the lifestyle. It's, a, it's an idolatrous, covetous lifestyle that has developed all based around entertainment. The stadiums for all of our sporting events are empty. The, the NRL, the rugby league in Australia, has just announced that its, its season's totally off. So now there's no NRL, no AFL, no basketball. In America, the, the NBA, the, 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 the big sporting things, all shut down. No one's in the stadiums. Let all the earth keep silence before Yahweh. There's, there's a silence. No more false worship ascending from those places. Everyone's forced to, to go back into a more simple lifestyle, spending a lot of time in the house, maybe spending a lot of time with family. What's God saying? Come back to what is important. Come back to the things that are eternal. I'm not going to let you keep living the way that you've been living. I'm not going to let you keep just doing all that. I'm going to block it for a time. I'm going to let all the earth keep silent. It's like God is almost saying, just shut up and listen to me. And go into that secret place and listen to the voice of the eternal God. And listen to what He is saying at this time. Now we come into Habakkuk chapter 3. Because out of this comes the response. There's a prayer of Habakkuk here, the prophet. And it says in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2, this is the prayer. O Yahweh, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Yahweh, revive your work in the midst of the years. Habakkuk is praying for revival. Habakkuk is saying, revive your work in the midst of the years. God, bring revival in the midst of all of this. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath. Remember mercy. In wrath, remember 
mercy. And we can pray that, God, in wrath. In, in, whether you think God's actually sending this, I know many Christians have this argument, oh, does God send judgment or is it the devil? In one sense, it doesn't really matter. If it's the devil or if it's God, well, God's either allowing the devil until we get up and tell it to go or God is sending it. It doesn't really matter how it's all playing out. The fact is it's here. And what are we going to learn? God, in wrath, remember mercy. Remember mercy. Remember mercy. And then it goes on to say, so in response to Habakkuk, praying for revival. And I know many of you who are listening, you would have been praying for revival. Many of us have been asking God for revival. And even coming into this year, we were sensing a real move of God, or just, just growing and, and, and coming up. The, the doors have been opening and things have been happening and we've been sensing that God is bringing revival. And, and we could think, wow, what, what's happening? Is God actually doing this? You know, is this, is, this, is this actually thwarting God's plans? Not at all. Because as you'll see here, God, it says God came from Timah, the Holy One from Mount Paran, verse 3. His glory covered the heavens. The earth was full of His praise. So brethren, let's make sure that the earth is full of God's praise from house to house, in your neighborhood, in your community. If you're in self-isolation, wow, now in your neighborhood, in your community, you can be offering up praise. Let all the earth be filled with God's praise. His brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from his hand, and there his power was hidden. So there's a place for us to come into the power of God at this particular time. Hallelujah. Yes, I can, David. I would love to do that. Thank you, Pastor David Chandler, being here. God bless you. And Tim Harris, great to see you. Yes, I'd love to be able to share that briefly tomorrow, David. It'll be wonderful. And then in verse 5 of Habakkuk chapter 3, it says, Before him, before God, went pestilence. Oh, that was an amazing verse when I saw this, just doing this simple study the other day. Wow. Before him went pestilence and fever followed at his feet. So in response to Habakkuk praying for revival, it says God is coming in his glory. He's got a, his glory covers the heavens. The earth is being filled with his praise. His brightness like the light. Wow. He's coming with light, the light of the gospel. And, and, and rays flashing from his hand. He's coming with power. Before him went pestilence. So maybe we could see that this pestilence is actually the precursor of God coming in an awesome, powerful, demonstrable way of revival into the nations. Hallelujah. Before him, in response to Habakkuk praying for revival, before him went pestilence and fever followed at his feet. Many are saying, oh, this is a sign, this is a sign of this and that coming. Maybe it's a sign of God coming in great revival in these days. Hallelujah. So my encouragement is get ready. Amen. And, and like it says in verse 3 there, let the earth be filled with His praise. So when you're in your house, when, wherever you are at this particular time, again, don't be listening to the media and getting all covered with fear. Praise God. Let the earth be filled with His praise. Encourage every household, every family. This is the time to develop that discipleship lifestyle uh, of a family devotional. Acts 2, chapter 42, continuing the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. It's a time of personal revival. It's a time of household revival. Get your kids involved. Teach them that this is a time where we're not to be afraid of pestilence, but we're to come into the secret place and we're to seek His face and we're to get into a place where we are overflowing with the presence of God in our midst, where we are being revived in His, in His presence. Hallelujah. And so let's worship Jesus. Let's worship Jesus in this time and encourage your brothers and sisters to do likewise. So in summary... So the first point about the pestilence was, let's abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Come under His covering. Get into the secret place. And we'll be delivered from the pestilence and the fear of it. Number two. Uh, what was number two? We were to... Uh, we, we are to make sure we're worshipping God in spirit and in truth. So that God is looking for true worship in spirit and truth. And he said that if Moses said to Pharaoh, if we don't go out to worship God the way he's told us to, then he may fall on us with pestilence. So let's worship God in spirit and truth. Number three, 
that in a series of judgments, God, as part of those series of judgments on, on His people, actually brings pestilence. Why? So that we'll be reformed. So that we'll get into reformation. Amen. And continue in the reformation. Number four is that because of rejecting God's plans of entering the inheritance and, re- and unbelief, then God says he'll bring pestilence, but then we can intercede for God's people to bring them into the next feast, to bring them into the land. Hallelujah. And God promises that he'll pardon the iniquity and fill the earth with his glory. Number five, uh, that we are to come to God in the midst of pestilence and pray towards this house and, and to seek his face, turn from our wicked ways. God will hear, he will forgive, and he will act. Hallelujah. Tim, that's great, man. The great I am is moving in our midst. Hallelujah. So, and then number six was that when God's leaders are out of order and looking at human measurements, God may allow a pestilence to come. But in the very place where that pestilence comes, the land is actually being prepared to become the place where the house of God is built, a dwelling place for God in the Spirit. And then number seven, that in in response to God, to, to Habakkuk, to us praying for revival, is that God... Before him goes pestilence and fever follows at his feet. We can expect that even as this pestilence moves through and does the work that God intends for it, and it will only last as long as it's necessary for us to to get in line with God, that revival, that it's a time where we can start to get into personal and household revival so that we are overflowing with the presence of Jesus. Amen. And to bring that revival into the earth as this passes through. So may the Lord Jesus bless you and keep you. And may this be a, a great blessing to you and uh, and just to, to, to renew our minds according to the Word of God about what this pestilence is all about. So I love you. Thank you all for tuning in. Great to see you, Tim. Uh, great to see that Pastor David Chandler was on here. Great to see some of you in other nations that were coming on here. Great to see you, Mama Ray, Jim and Ann straight down in Victoria, John and Lorraine Rolston. Wonderful Darlene and Jeff also being on here. Arthur Lagaluga, great to see you. John Baldwin in, um, in Sydney, great to see you. Uh, it's just wonderful. Gay, wonderful to see you on here as well. Amen. And Deanna Burns from in the Territory. God bless you. It's great to see Debbie Van Latham tuning in as well. Julie Auld. Thank you, Father. So God, may you bless each and every one with the spirit of revelation, spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus. Amen. So God bless you. Much love and much grace as you seek God in these times. Amen.